you can support In the Past Lane by buying some of our merchandise. We've got merch with quotations from famous people in history, like Abraham Lincoln, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history, and Confucius, who said, study the past if you would control the future. And we've got some snarky ones, too, like one of our bestsellers that says, Dear America, okay, I'm begging you, stop repeating this shit. Signed, History. You can get these designs and many more on everything from a t-shirt or a hoodie to a coffee mug or a beach towel. Just go to our website, inthepastlane.com, and click on Merchandise. Thanks. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more so huddled union, masses yearning to breathe consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. And the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Hi there. Welcome to In the Pass Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. Brought to you by SBI, Snoring Beagle International, and coming to you from the Panic of 1893 Studios, located in central Massachusetts. I'm your host, historian at large, Edward T. O'Donnell, and this is episode 191. Every week here at In the Past Lane, I tell you what happened in U.S. history this week, with special attention to one important story. So what's happening at In the Past Lane this week? Well, what can I say? Not much has changed since last week, and I suspect that's true of you too. Lots of Zoom chats with students, family, and friends. And lots of cooking and getting the backyard garden in order. Plus, lots of bread baking. My social media posts about my sourdough bread baking have elicited a lot of requests for some of my fabulous 16-year-old starter. And I've been obliging whenever possible. Last Sunday, I met up with various members of my very large family, safely masked and socially distant, of course, and distributed five doses of sourdough starter. And because one of them chose the perfect meetup spot, we all grab some amazing barbecue takeout. Let me know if you want some starter, and I'll see what I can do. All right, let's get on with it. Here's what happened this week in American history. Let's start with this. On April 30th, 1894, a man named Jacob Coxey arrived in Washington, D.C. at the head of a group of about 500 men. By then, the whole nation knew them as Coxey's Army. They had set out weeks earlier from Coxey's hometown of Massillon, Ohio, in what was the first ever March on Washington. So what was all the fuss about? The immediate answer was that in the spring of 1894, the United States was in the midst of the most severe economic depression in its history. It was triggered one year earlier by the financial panic of 1893, which caused tens of thousands of businesses and farms to fail, and the unemployment rate to soar to 20%, and often double that in big cities like Chicago and New York. The U.S. had seen its share of economic depressions in the 19th century. The Panic of 1837, the Panic of 1857, the Panic of 1873, just to name a few. In each of these previous cases, political leaders agreed that the best policy was do nothing. Depressions, the reasoning went, were like bad weather or an illness. Wait long enough and the good times would return. The most dangerous thing that the government could do was to provide assistance to the people, because, so the logic went, That would only foster dependence and lead the U.S. down the path to socialism. Here's how President Grover Cleveland put it in his second inaugural address in March of 1893. The lessons of paternalism ought to be unlearned, and the better lesson taught that while the people should patriotically and cheerfully support their government, its functions do not include the support of the people. Despite proclamations like this, there was growing support among many Americans in this period known as the Gilded Age, for the government to take a more active role in the economy to protect the vulnerable from exploitation and promote the greatest possible amount of opportunity for all. They argued that laissez-faire, or the idea that the government should keep its hands off the economy, might have made sense back in the late 18th century, when the U.S. took form. But not anymore in an age of industry, wage work, mass immigration, huge cities, and giant corporations. That was the view that inspired Jacob Coxey. He was no radical at least compared to the socialists, communists, and anarchists of the day. He was actually a successful farmer, who also bred horses for sale and owned a sand quarry business. But as a farmer in the 1880s, he'd gotten involved in the burgeoning protest movement among farmers that came to be called populism. Its leaders argued that the only way to effectively battle the power of monopolies and trusts was to create a political movement that would elect farmers and pro-farmer politicians to office so that they could use this political power to curb the power of banks, railroads, and brokers, and save the honest American farmer from ruin. In 
and in 1892, they established a new national party called the People's Party that called for a wide range of new government policies. Everything from a government takeover of the railroads and telegraphs to the adoption of a graduated income tax that would make the rich pay their fair share. Its candidate for president that year polled one million votes and won four states. It was no joke. So his embrace of populism explains Jacob Coxey's motivations behind his protest march. He advocated that, given the severity of the Depression, the federal government must abandon its traditional commitment to laissez-faire and provide funding to states to create public works projects such as road building, to alleviate mass unemployment and stimulate the economy. Now, if this sounds familiar, it's because Coxey was advocating an approach to economic crisis that 40 years later would be embraced by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt during the Great Depression. And succeeding administrations, of course, have turned to varying forms of stimulus packages, as we now call them, to boost the economy and help workers in times of economic crisis. To draw attention to this idea, Coxey organized his march to Washington, D.C. He actually got the idea from a fellow activist named Carl Brown, who was more of a true blue radical. He not only came up with the idea of a march, but also the group's official name, the Common Wheel of Christ, which was intended to evoke both the ideals of the common good and Christianity. About 120 men gathered in Massillon, Ohio, and on Easter Sunday, 1894, they set off for the nation's capital. As the press picked up the story, the group acquired a new name, Coxey's Army. It was meant, on the one hand, to evoke ridicule, and on the other, to stoke fears of radicalism and civil unrest. The press alternately dismissed them as a bunch of delusional cranks, or depicted them as a group of losers who wanted handouts and a socialist revolution. But Coxey dismissed this talk and declared that his army's campaign was one to save the republic and honest capitalism from the clutches of corporate trusts and the politicians they controlled. Despite the negative press, as they marched, more men joined the ranks, including some African-American men. Jacob Coxey had hoped to assemble an army of 100,000 men, but in the end he had to settle for a peak of 500. In some places, they were met by hostile townspeople and policemen who threatened arrest if they set up camp. But in many places, Coxey and his growing number of followers were greeted by enthusiastic supporters who offered money, food, clothing, and shoes, as well as words of support. Finally, after walking 400 miles in 35 days, Coxey's army arrived in Washington, D.C. on April 30, 1894. As this was the first ever protest march on Washington, apprehension was in the air as the men set up a makeshift camp. Hundreds of police and 1,500 soldiers stood by, ready for a confrontation. The next day, May 1st, Coxey tried to enter the U.S. Capitol to deliver a speech before Congress. But security guards turned him away. So Coxey tried the next best thing, delivering the speech in front of the Capitol. But before he started speaking, police arrested him and took him off to jail. He was charged with disturbing the peace, but the charges were eventually reduced and he was only convicted for walking on the lawn of the Capitol grounds. Had he spoken that day, Jacob Coxey would have said in part, We stand here today in behalf of millions of toilers whose petitions have been buried in committee rooms, whose prayers have been unresponded to, and whose opportunities for honest, remunerative, productive labor have been taken from them by unjust legislation which protects idlers, speculators, and gamblers. While Jacob Coxey did not get what he came for in Washington, D.C., the larger populist movement to which he belonged did influence a generation of reformers who, in what we now call the Progressive Era, achieved notable successes in enacting many of the populist party demands, and so much more, ranging from regulations on trusts to measures to improve working conditions, public health, and political reform. And then there's this. Fifty years later to the day that he was arrested for trying to give a speech on the steps of the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C., a 90-year-old Jacob Coxey was allowed to deliver that speech. On May 1, 1944, he stood on the Capitol steps and said what had been on his mind way back in 1894. But by then, in the wake of the New Deal and its vast array of government programs to alleviate suffering during the Great Depression, Coxey's speech seemed hardly radical at all. What a difference a half-century makes. So what else of note happened this week in U.S. history? April 28, 1967, 
heavyweight champion boxer Muhammad Ali defied the draft and refused to be inducted into the U.S. military to fight in Vietnam. Ali argued that his religious beliefs prohibited him from participating in a war against the poor, non-white people of Vietnam. He was widely condemned for his stand, and subsequently stripped of his boxing title and sentenced to five years in prison. I have nothing to lose by standing up for my beliefs, said Ali, so I'll go to jail. So what? We've been in jail for 400 years. The sentence was later overturned. April 30th, 1789, the first presidential inauguration took place in New York City. George Washington took the oath of office at Federal Hall on Wall Street before a crowd of thousands. April 30th, 1975, South Vietnam fell to the forces of North Vietnam, marking the unofficial end to the Vietnam War. For Americans, this moment is captured in the photograph of people boarding a helicopter on the roof of the American embassy in Saigon. And if you want to learn more about the Vietnam War, check out In the Past Lane episode 39, featuring my interview with Ken Burns talking about his documentary about the Vietnam War. And what notable people were born this week? April 28th, 1758, the fifth president of the United States, James Monroe. April 29, 1899, composer and jazz orchestra leader, Duke Ellington. May 2nd, 1903, Dr. Benjamin Spock, author of the best-selling book on baby care and a high-profile opponent of the Vietnam War. And May 3rd, 1919, folk singer and activist for social justice, Pete Seeger. Okay, time for the last word. Let's give it to Jacob Coxey, who, 126 years ago this week, arrived at the head of the first march on Washington. Here's a passage from the speech he hoped to deliver that day from the steps of the U.S. Capitol. We stand here to declare by our march of over 400 miles through difficulties and distress that we are law-abiding citizens, and as men our actions speak louder than words. We are here to petition for legislation which will furnish employment for every man able and willing to work, for legislation which will bring universal prosperity and emancipate our beloved country from financial bondage to the descendants of King George. We have come to the only source which is competent to aid the people in their day of dire distress. We are here to tell our representatives, who hold their seats by grace of our ballots, that the struggle for existence has become too fierce and relentless. We come and throw up our defenseless hands and say help, or we and our loved ones must perish. We are engaged in a bitter and cruel war with the enemies of all mankind, a war with hunger, wretchedness, and despair, and we ask Congress to heed our petitions and issue for the nation's good a sufficient volume of the same kind of money which carried the country through one awful war and saved the life of the nation. We appeal to every peace-loving citizen, every liberty-loving man or woman, everyone in whose breast the fires of patriotism and love of country have not died out, to assist us in our efforts towards better laws and general benefits. Well, that's going to do it for In the Past Lane this week. You can learn more about me and everything we talked about at InThePassLane.com. And let's interact via social media. I'm at InThePassLane on both Twitter and Instagram, and our Facebook page is In the Past Lane Podcast. See you next week. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. 